All right, Diane, do you want to go ahead and get us started? You betcha. All right, so you can hear me? I'm good. Good. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Diane Hernandez. Um, I am with Support for Careers at Children and Families of Iowa. It is a brand new program here at Children and Families of Iowa uh, doing support. I don't know, but I just had to help poor Corey. Take it to work. <laughs> Um, and, um, I want to start out by thanking the folks that sponsored this, uh, IC, APSI, and the Brain Injury Alliance of Iowa, um, all have promoted this, and I really appreciate that. Um, as far as kind of like, uh, orders of business, um, if you guys want to keep your cameras off, I'm pretty much okay with that. If you want to keep your cameras on and nod enthusiastically about how great the presentation yeah, is. Yeah, that. Um, we'll have people putting their questions in the chat box, like she said. However, um, if people have something that they feel like there's going to be people, there's a lot of people on this. So there's definitely going to be people who um, have had experience with brain injury, have a brain injury, have family members with a brain injury. Um, I know I did a quick quick survey and I know uh, June Klein-Bacon from the BIA is on this. So she may have things that she wants to say. So feel free to unmute um, if there's a point or even if you want to um, challenge me on something. I actually kind of like that. I would like it if people muted, <laughs> but other than that, I'm good. Um, today we're going to be doing a general uh, brain injury 101 um, session. This is part of a four-part session. Um, I want to assure everyone that what we're going to be talking about today is mostly like the actual brain science. So when people say it's not brain science, this actually is brain science. Um, and we're going to be talking about that today. In the future sessions, in the next three, we're probably going to be do, using doing a lot more talking about tools and techniques and resources. And we'll have people come in and speak um, that are going to talk about resources. There's going to be plenty of practical information um, in this, but we're going to start out um, kind of just with the basics of the brain. Um, on this slide right here, you will see my email address. Um, I would appreciate it if everybody, um, I know that we're going to be sending these out, um, the slides out, but please write down my email address. Um, we're going to be together for a while, for four sessions, and I want to make sure that everybody gets their questions, thoughts, cases that they want to have, talk about. Um, if I can't talk, if I can't incorporate it into the next three sessions, um, I might even just reach out to you individually to talk through something, but I don't want anybody to walk away from this feeling like I wish she talked about and I didn't talk about that thing. So if there's something, if you want to send me an email, tell me why you're here. Like, why would you commit to this four week program? Right. Um, that would be incredibly helpful to me and, um, good for all of us, um, to gain experience. So Again, feel free to comment, let me know what you want, and we'll just kind of walk through this whole thing together. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I have a background in brain injury uh, professionally um, and a background in disability employment. So I worked for a while um, in residential homes that dealt with the neurobehavioral rehabilitation so this is for people who are in danger of incarceration, institutionalization, hospitalization, or homelessness due to their behaviors, due to brain injury. Um, so worked in those homes. Uh, I was a brain injury case manager for a while. So I assessed people with brain injuries to see kind of what level of service they might need. Um, in addition to that, I worked um, with uh, Iowa Workforce for a while with their disability employment initiative um, for, for a while, actually. Um, I have a CRC, I'm a CRC, so a certified rehabilitation counselor, and I got my degree from Drake, go Drake. Um, 
all of that is to say that I have experience both with employment with disability and with brain injury, um, which is a fancy way of saying I'm not a doctor. Um, I don't, I'm not a neuroscientist or neurologist, and there's people who know way more than I do. Um, but I do have experience in both of those areas. And so that's kind of what brings me to the table today to talk to you guys about the brain injury. So like I said, we're going to be doing, to, um, we're going to be talking today mostly about definitions, etiology, brain anatomy, that kind of thing as part of this four part series. And in future parts, we're gonna be talking more about techniques, tools, and resources. And if you're thinking, oh, but I don't wanna do the science -y part, Diane. Um, why on earth should I have to do the science -y part, Diane? Um, then let me explain this. Um, if you do the science -y part, it will help you understand what's happening to the person that you're serving. So your explanation guides your intervention. If you don't understand what's going on with the person served, um, then you can't create the interventions to help them. In addition to that, it helps you explain to the person served what's happening to them. And if you feel like you can do that in a more general sense, and I'm gonna give you an example. So, um, I, when I was doing the brain injury assessing, I was in a hospital one time with someone who had a brand new injury um, and they were just mostly cussing like all the time. And so when I went into the hospital, the nurses started talking about how they, the nurses were very proud of the interventions that they were having to try to correct this person for cussing so much. Um, and granted, I think maybe he got his brain injury during a drug run. I don't think he had like exemplary man. Um, language prior to the brain injury, but he, all he could do was cuss and setting nursing staff, blah, blah, blah. So I walked in the hospital room and I said, do you want me to explain to you why this is happening? And this guy looks up to me and is like, like his eyes are just like, yes, please. Um, and I explained how most of language is stored in the, uh, kind of it gets generated from the left temporal lobes or the left side of your brain. Um, and that in this particular case, that wasn't what was happening, that, that, um, but that, um, cuss words or love words, anything that's like a really emotional word, um, is stored more in the limbic system or the reptilian brain and gets stored way deep down. It's a lot safer. It's kept a lot safer from the brain injury than the word banana or chair or coat or and I said, so when you're trying to come up with words, because those cuss words were stored in a different part of your brain, they're easier to access. That's why they're coming out so quickly and why you can't find all the other words. And I said, that's why it's, that's why it's so much easier to cuss than it is um, to find other words. And he went, this guy who really said nothing but F you the entire time I've been there, um, looked up and was like, so much easier so much easier and it gave so much relief to him to understand what was happening to him. Um, and so that's a very different explanation than to just say you had a brain injury and so now you just can't control your language. Um, it's a very specific thing and the more specific that you get, um, the more that you can help the person served. And that's because words matter, the way we say things matter. And that helps build those positive, mutually reinforcing relationships that are so important um, in having good relations with people who have brain injuries um, or anybody. It's always good to have mutually positive, reinforcing relationship. Um, when you guys get these slides, down at the bottom of it, it there's a, a link to something that says using hands to describe the brain. Um, I'm gonna, I, I don't know if you can, I don't know who can see me or not, but um, there's, if this is a brief part, if you take the amygdala or the limbic system and you think of that as being the reptilian brain, and then you think of the um, frontal lobe or the, uh, corp, uh, the rest of the brain, the gray matter kind of wrapping around that, um, then that is how we can show a brain. And we can 
talk about the brain. The, basically, what I'm telling you is you have a model of a brain in your hand all the time. And if you go to this link, it'll show you how to do that. And sometimes that me, that's super helpful when you're talking to someone with a brain injury. If you find one of these things that you want to explain, you can always use your little hand model brain right here um, to help tell the person kind of what's going on. These are my people. Um, and I bring them up at the beginning of the presentation because they're gonna come up off and on. And so I wanna introduce you to my people. Um, this is my mother. And um, one of my, my, actually she was my freshman year roommate uh, when I was getting my bachelor's, Becky. Um, both of these folks have brain injuries. My mom has two brain injuries and Becky actually also has two brain injuries. Um, my mom um, had a thing called hydrocephalus, which caused her, the ventricle, it's basically too much fluid on the brain, which we think of as like happening in the babies, but it happened to my mom when she was like in her seventies. Um, she got a shunt put in, um, got a whole lot better and then fell, got a subdural hematoma and her left frontal lobe and now is having all kinds of problems. She'll come up because she's a big part of my life in dealing with brain injury. Um, Becky had a thing called a cavernoma, which is basically when your blood vessels form little raspberries and then they started to bleed out. And then when they did surgery on her, uh, she stroked out several times and now she's in a nursing home in Dallas. Um, I love both these people a lot. And when people know that I love these two people a lot, a lot of times they think, wow, that must be why she's in, um, so it has such a passion for brain injuries because it's affected these loved ones. The fact of the matter is that is not true. Um, I had been doing brain injury for years, um, decade-ish or so, um, before either one of these folks acquired their brain injury. And that might sound like a crazy random happenstance, but that is not in fact true. It's just true that brain injuries are very, very prevalent. Um, within the state of Iowa, there's over 95,000 Iowans living with a brain injury, about the size of Waterloo, Ames, Iowa City. Um, so it's a lot of people. We've got traumatic brain injury on this chart in comparison to breast cancer or MS. So that's kind of giving you an idea of how prevalent two people on here. Um, there's also more prevalence of compound problems. Um, once you get an initial brain injury, you're three times, and I've heard up to six times, June, you pipe in if you've got different numbers than what I've got. Um, but after one brain injury, you're three times more likely to get a second injury. Um, after your second injury, you're about eight times more likely to get a third injury. Um, which is why I have so many conversations with my mom that goes something like this. What do we not do ever again, mom? And she says, we don't fall down. And I say, that is right. We do not want to fall down because if we fall down, the results at this point could be pretty disastrous. Um, there, where you're going to be affected by brain injury for a whole lot of different reasons. Um, whenever I meet somebody and start working with them, um, I say, I'm an expert in brain injury. That's I'm a subject matter expert in that particular thing. I am not a subject matter expert in you. Um, we have a saying in the brain injury world that once you see one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. And that's because people are complicated, super duper complicated. We have complicated lives with complicated trauma, with complicated interactions, with complicated neurology that's different in every single person. And so you're never gonna see two brain injuries that manifest themselves exactly in the same way. A um, little bit more on definitions. Um, all brain injuries are known as acquired brain injuries or ABIs, meaning that all brain injuries are that. Are that. Um, we have non-traumatic brain injuries and we have traumatic brain injuries. Non-traumatic brain injuries are things like strokes, aneurysms, tumors, things that happen within the brain on a sort of organic, in a sort of organic sense. 
Um, traumatic brain injuries are anything where there's an assault. So if you bang your head against something, if something penetrates your skull, if you could penetrate your skull, it's pretty much an open brain injury. It means it breaks the skull. If the skull stays intact um, during an assault or a fall or an accident, then that's going to be a closed brain injury, but it's going to mean that something banged against something, something hit something, and that's what caused the injury. So all traumatic brain injuries are acquired brain injuries, but not all acquired brain injuries are traumatic brain injuries. All oaks are trees, not all trees are oaks, right? Um, a stroke is a neurological impairment. Um, we have ischemic strokes and hemorrhage strokes. Um, ischemic just basically means that there was a block of blood flow and hemorrhage means that the blood went where it was not supposed to go. Ischemic, it didn't go where it was supposed to go. So we have a lot of dead gray matter. Hemorrhage, it went where it was not supposed to go and that resulted in some damage. I'm going to see, I'm talking really fast. <laughs> so, Jan, June says that's still pretty accurate data, so it's good to know I'm on the right track. Um, when we have, mo most of the brain injuries that you're going to see um, that are traumatic brain injuries, in other words, something hits something, um, you're going to have some what's called contracoup injury, um, which means, so we think of, when someone's in a car accident, we're gonna be pretty sure that the part of the head that hit the dashboard, right? That that part got hurt, right? That makes sense. What we don't tend to think about is how it could be affecting everything else in your brain and particularly the back part of your brain. If you go forward, your brain is encased in fluid in your skull and it floats around in there. It, the, it's an organ, it's encased in bone, but it floats. When, when it full force forwards, when you hit that steering wheel or when you hit that dashboard and your brain bumps forward against the front part of your brain where there's a bunch of pointy edges, that's why it gets so much damage gets caused in the frontal lobe, then it's also going to bounce back and it's going to hit the other side. So brain damage doesn't happen, particularly in that kind of car accident, motorcycle accident, bike accident kind of thing, doesn't tend to happen in just one part of the brain. It happens in a bunch of parts of the brain as the brain bashes around within the skull. The other thing that happens is that you're gonna have neuro, basically what that turns into is damages to your neurons or what we known um, as axonal brain damage. Um, so if you look at here, here's the little axon. These are neurons. I could go into a long conversation about what a neuron is, but let's just go with this picture and look at this pretty neuron. See how there's a pretty neuron over here? And over here, there's a very not pretty neuron that's got lots of damage. We're just gonna go with the general idea that the one that's pretty works better than the one that's all torn apart. So when you get shearing and tearing and breaking of these neurons, they don't work that well, which means that they don't transfer data that well, right? And so that's a lot of what we're seeing with a brain injury. Um, one of the reasons that we are seeing more people live through brain injuries than we used to see, like back in the day, really pretty much before, before Vietnam, um, is we people would just die. Um, during Vietnam, they were able to figure out that um, we get an initial injury or that primary injury, that coup, contra coup, tearing, shearing, bad, bad axonal injuries that I showed you before. And then what happens is the brain gets all beat up and it swells like tissue does when it gets injured, right? So it's going to swell, but the brain doesn't have any place to go because the skull is pretty solid. So if it swells up in that um, skull, then that is going to cause more damage. There's gonna be more bleeding. There's gonna be more problems. That's what's gonna cause that secondary injury. That's why when people go into the hospital with brain injury, they'll take a part of the skull away. And it's so, and you can see this picture down at the bottom. It's so that the brain can, has a place to go 
And then if it has a place to go, then it swells up, it goes to that place, starts feeling better, the swelling goes down, and then they put in a plate to hold your skull into place, basically to make up for the part of the brain they took away. And that's why that happens, is that we're trying, um, we're trying to avoid further damage. When my mom, you'll see in this picture, the ventricles, um, what happened with my mom was the ventricle started to fill up with fluid and she actually had to get the hole in her skull and get a shunt that runs down and drains into her stomach so that she stopped having so much swelling in her brain. Um, and she walked a whole heck of a lot better when she didn't have all that pressing up against her motor cortex. Um, there's classifications of head injuries. A super important part of this is that we consider a severe brain injury anybody who's had a loss of consciousness for more than 24 hours. So we kind of run a continuum on that classification of head injuries from bump on the head with no visible damage to death, right? That's the worst outcome. Um, however, that doesn't really have anything to do with what kind, I mean, it does. I mean, a worse brain injury is gonna probably work, result in worse symptomology. However, you can have a fairly mild brain injury and it can have huge ramifications, especially if it's that second or that third or that fourth brain injury, right? So my mom's second brain injury, she didn't lose consciousness, but we're going to go with that based on my personal experience dealing with her, that it isn't what I would consider a mild brain injury because the symptoms were really bad. The fact that she didn't realize that she should go to the hospital, we had to tell her later on, and she tried to hide from us that she'd fallen. It's a thing. Um, but it's not necessarily indicative of what kind of neurological situations we're going to find ourselves in. Um, so now I am going to talk about the two halves of the brain because I want to dispel a couple of myths. One, you are not right-brained or left-brained. You're whole-brained, much like you're whole-hearted, you're whole-lunged, you're whole-intestined, you're all of your organs, you use all of it. You don't use a part of it, you don't use a part of it more than you use another part of it. It is true that the different sides, like the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body, the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. Um, there's more language stuff in the left side. There's more kind of visual stuff on the right side. However, there's corpus callosum, which is this thing in the middle that there's a lot of traffic in between those two places, right? So it's all talking to itself. We also, and I hope most people don't still believe this, we don't use 10% of our brain. We use all of our brain, like we use all of our heart and all of our other organs all of the organ is important just because a lot of times we'll talk about like it as a car um you know might not be using your brakes all of the time but they're super important when you need them right so we are using all of our brain all the time just doing a little bit of spelling all right now we get into the juicy stuff um the parts of the brain um We've got basic brain geography right here. Um, I had a neurosurgeon explain the brain one of the best ways I know how, although I'm sure it would make my English major daughter insane because there's like it's like a three part mixed metaphor. But the way he explained it is the brain is like a grapefruit, and the grapefruit has a rind, right? So that rind is your cerebral cortex. And within that cerebral cortex, there's a whole bunch of files. That's where all your filing systems are, is within the rind of that grapefruit. That's the part two of the mixed metaphor. Now I'm going to mix up my metaphors even more. The red part is just that intergalactic highway that moves information across, oops, I didn't mean to do that, across the brain. So we've got the rind where all the files are, and we've got the 
intergalactic highway that's in the middle, and that's what everything works off of, right? Um, within that cerebral cortex, then we start talking about the lobes. So we've got the frontal lobe up here in the front. We've got the periental lobe right here, occipital lobe. So it's generally, I'm going to go with brief overview. Here's where all the th stuff, the pink part, that's where all the part that we think about thinking is. When we think about thinking, it's all up here. Although the whole brain's doing the thinking part. Um, it's just the thinking about thinking that happens up in this red part. Uh, the periental lobe is more like your sense of touch and pressure, taste, bodily awareness, huge part of bodily awareness. Um, temporal lobes um, is going to have hearing, recognizing things, emotions, language, long-term memory. Occipital lobe is mostly sight, weirdly, because it's way far away from where the eyes are. Um, and the cere cerebellum, this is going to be motor control. And then the limbic system, that fight, flight, or freeze, um, that part of my brain that was activated when I had a dream last night that I was about to start this presentation and I couldn't find my computer. Um, and I was panicking, literal dream I had last night. Um, all of that was activating that limbic system part of my brain. Um, the frontal lobes, we're gonna go back to what we're looking at as that pink part of the brain. Um, that's where um, we're gonna see a lot of problems with um, people who are experiencing problems due to their brain injury, right? Because we think about this as being the area of the brain that controls so many things. Um, so it controls initiation, it controls problem solving, inhibition. I'm gonna go through a bunch of stuff. I'm gonna stop for a minute. I can't see if there's a chat, if there's chat open. I'm not sure why I can't. Um, I'm gonna mention it for you and we're good. Okay, okay we're good. Um, but this is what causes, so the frontal lobes call, uh, call for initiation, problem solving, inhibition of behavior. When we're doing job coaching, a lot of times the things that we're going to mostly be thinking about are that inhibition of behavior or problem solving, um, planning and anticipating motions, um, self-monitoring, motor planning, thinking about how we're going to move the different parts of our body. All of that is affected by those frontal lobes. It's going to be personality and emotions, awareness, abilities and limitations, organization, mental flexibility, and attention and concentration. This is like everything, right? Um, and one of the things that I think is really important is we tend to think of frontal lobe damage primarily in the areas of lack of, um, it, because these are the things that cause the most problems for people a lot of times, is that lack of inhibition, that thing where people with brain injuries just say whatever they're thinking. Um, which is probably why I get along so well with them because I have a tendency to do that too. Um, but there's so many things, there's so many parts that when you break down, like there's five different types of attention, right? Um, when we break down each one of these functions and really grow to understand them, we might have a better understanding of why we have the personality and emotions or the frustration tolerance or why people get so aggravated. Um, when we talk about initiation, that can be anything from, like I have one client um, who was left, is, was left-handed before his injury um, and he's struggling. So he's having to learn, he's, now he's got, he's left-handed he had a right side injury. It affected his left hand. So now he's having to learn to write right-handed. Um, and he's gotten pretty good at it, but he keeps saying over and over again to me, um, when he's trying to sign something or write something, he's like, it's always hard to get it started. Like he, he can put the, he has trouble once he gets the pen to the paper, that first motion, to move the pen to write his name, he has a struggle with. 
That's different than not being able to write your name. That means it's just, it's the initiation, the motor initiation that he's having trouble with. Whereas my mom, if I was going to think about initiation problems, I would think more like my, what the first thing that comes to mind is my dad going, she's not doing anything. She, they just recently moved and my dad was constantly complaining because my mom wasn't helping pack up, not realizing that my mom could help pack up. But you have to go with her and help her on the way of initiating the activity. She just can't initiate activities on her own. She needs someone to help her do those things. Um, another thing that I, for some reason has been hugely in my life of lately um, is strategy shifting. So strategy shifting is the idea that if we run up against a problem or if we try something one way and it doesn't work, can we figure out how to change the approach that we're using on that to in other in a, in, to solve that problem? So um, we have a client who works at um, is a barista, and I was with him one day when someone asked for this pinwheel Danish thing, and he comes at the Danish with the tongs from the top well the the tongs weren't big enough that to catch the width of the danish right and he's just kept jabbing the danish with the top of the tongs as opposed to changing the hand motion and like coming on coming up under the danish and grabbing it like with the small end of the danish or vertically um to pull it off the tray and that's strategy shifting um and so that's one of the things that we're working is to calm down. And when something doesn't work, how do we stop ourselves and come up with a new strategy? Um, one of the things that I think about when I think about strategy shifting a lot are, are an ability to solve problems because of problems with that strategy shifting situation is if you think about and I, I can't find the movie, but I know that I saw a movie where Will Ferrell was someone with someone and they were trying to get over the wall and they were up against the wall and they're banging. And all you can see is there, there's this giant wall and they're trying to climb over and it's this huge issue and not realizing that it was a very short wall and you could just walk around the wall. But you can't tell that you need to walk around the wall unless you get far enough away from the wall to realize that it's a short wall that you can actually walk around. And that's what happens with strategy shifting. We're so close to the problem that we just keep banging at it, trying to fix it, as opposed to stepping away from it and going, okay, I'm just gonna, oh, you know what? Here's this other way, right? Um, one of the reasons I'm spending so much time on strategy shifting is that um, when we think about people who have low frustration tolerance or who get really upset, um, sometimes, part of that inability to control our emotions or control that frustration or not act out is because we're not working on that strategy shifting, right? So if we start with, so with this client that works um, as a barista, he had one kind of big emotional upset around, that was around some spilled chocolate syrup and it became a big deal. Um, so when he and I are talking about how do we handle problems, we, we kind of refer it to it pinwheel to, to chocolate syrup problems. Like the pinwheel was not a big deal and we were able to work it out. The chocolate syrup thing was a big, bigger deal. Um, but if we can learn, concentrate on helping our individuals served handle the strategy shifting on those smaller items, then we're gonna be able to help them also apply that to those bigger instances that cause the bigger outbursts, right? The other thing that will happen with frontal lobe damage that we don't typically think about when we're thinking about frontal lobe problems is the ability to categorize things. So um, my mom can't categorize things. Um, and I was talking to a psychologist about my mom can't categorize things, meaning that she can't order things off a menu. Um, and the reason that she can't order things off a menu is because she cannot look at a selection of choices 
and pick which one is the best choice. So therefore menus obviously are really overwhelming and take a really long time. And maybe you should download the menu before you ever go to the restaurant because it's going to take a terribly long time for her to be able to pick. And usually she needs someone to kind of nudge her in a direction um, because she just can't figure out what, what matters most, right? Um, so again, problem solving, we can get the menu beforehand, kind of talk about it before we go. That's called being early. Um, it has bigger ramifications if for say, hypothetically, you were helping them move out of the house that they lived in for 45 years and your mother couldn't tell you that a scrap of fabric was super important, but a book that all her friends had signed was not. Um, she just doesn't have that ability. Um, and all of that can affect you. But when you're working with individuals with brain injury, you also have to keep in mind that they're part of a bigger system. They're part of a bigger life. They have different, like I said, if you've experienced one brain injury, you've experienced one brain injury. For some reason, right now, I seem to know a lot, a lot of brain injured ex-bartenders. It's not even that they had alcohol related injuries, like most of them had strokes or something. Um, but bartenders have very can have very what is appropriate for a bartender to say is very different from what it is what you're allowed to say in another work environment. The way bartenders talk to their coworkers is very different than the way that most people talk to their coworkers. Um, and so teaching, a pro so talking about what is appropriate behavior in the workplace is going to be really different. Both because they don't have that frontal lobe stopgap that uh, is not as attentive to making sure that we know what's appropriate and not appropriate, but also because in the case of what seems to be a huge number of brain injured bartenders, um, you know they'll all say, "I'll say, you, you know, I'll ask them." We do some different assessments, and I'll say appropriateness, ability to speak appropriately, and they're all like, "I'm a bartender, man. We don't talk appropriately. That's not a thing." Um, so we'll have to work on that. Um, other things that can happen with frontal lobe damage is we have reduced self-awareness, we have reduced inhibition, emotional regulation, super hard. People can go from, from cold to hot super fast, hot to cold super fast. Some people cry when they're happy. Maybe the emotions are not appropriate to the situation. Um, physically reacting out. Um, another thing that my mom does um, is that she's super susceptible to scams. And that also has to do with that um, strategy shifting. So when something comes up, like if, if my mom gets a text or an email that says that there's, that she just won an iPad, she is for sure going to click on that thing to get that free iPad. And I mean, we finally figured out a number of things that we can put in place. And if that's a particular problem that anybody has, please contact me directly because I've spent a lot of time on this. Um, but the problem is once, like all of us, when we see um, that we might've won an iPad, we go, oh yeah, I won an iPad. And you get excited about it. And then most of us, we are then, you know, the frontal lobe comes in and says, hey, maybe you didn't win an iPad. And then you don't click on that. Um, my mom has gone to the races by the time any frontal lobe could possibly um, try to get engaged in that. And so therefore she's going forward. And I think that's a lot of what our folks are experiencing. Like we've got to figure out, um, they may not be able to stop themselves. And so then we've got to be able to look at the situation and figure out what are things that we can put in place if we've got an activity that can't be stopped. Um, we put in place, she uses gift cards, she doesn't have credit cards. We put in place um, that there's a lot of restrictions on our phone. I found a bunch of apps so that she doesn't see everything. We changed her email address. We did a lot of things because what um, she would say when I would be trying to talk to her about it is, well, can't I just stop doing it? And what my dad would say was she just needs to get it through her head that she can't keep doing this. And what I would say back is asking the brain injured person to be less brain injured is probably not going to help. So we've got to be able to come up 
with alternate strategies for addressing these things that are causing problems in the lives of the persons served. How did we find out about the frontal lobe or about how brains work in general? Um, this is Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage is probably the most famous brain injured person in science circles. Um, uh, he was in like the 1800s or whatever. He worked in the railway and he was packing some dynamite, I'm supposing, some explosive, and you pack it down with this 13 pound pole. He was packing it down and the explosive went off and it, the 13 pound pole went up through his jawline, across his eyeball and out the right side of his head. It kept going and it landed and the 13 pound pole was perfectly fine, except for that it had some brain matter on it. Um, and Phineas was also fine. Phineas walked away from it, walked home. People were like, Phineas, dude, you're looking good. Other than, you know, the hole in the head and the fact that you lost your eye. Um, but the doctor described Phineas as being um, fitful, irreverent, indulgent, and at times using the grossest of profanities. Um, Phineas's personality completely changed. Um, and this was the big, actually the beginning of modern brain science, of us being able to know that the brain, different portions of the brain served different things, and that if we damaged a very specific portion of the brain, it could affect our behavior. The periental lobes um, are the part of the brain that does the primary sensory, it's the primary sensory cortexes. So this is where we're going to, so we have, you can see from this that we've got one side of the brain is gonna go touch. It's all, everything like touch, feel, hearing, touch and feel. It's gonna be, I'm gonna, my periental lobe on my left side is gonna do the feeling that I'm getting on my hand and my foot on my right side and the opposite. The left side's gonna control the tongue and taste right side's going to control hearing. Um, it registers everything around us and it helps us know where we are in space and time. So the visual, there's visual pathways and the periental lobes that are going to tell us what things are. So if I'm going to have a water bottle, there's going to be a part, the visual pathway is going to tell me that it's a water bottle. The dorsal visual pathway, so a little higher, is going to tell me where that water bottle is in space. So I can't reach forward and grab my water bottle. I can't put my water bottle in my mouth and turn it up and drink it without that periental lobe, because that's what's going to be able to tell me where I am in space. When we damage the periental lobe, that's when we're going to find ourselves with hemispatial neglect, um, which basically means that somebody is not aware of the opposite side of their body. So people might put their makeup on just the left side. They might only dress just their left side. Um, a lot of times it's going to happen with right side strokes and the person's going to be able to not know that they have like a left side if somebody if you have periental lobe damage a lot of times people kind of walk up to you on one side and you're not even aware that they're there um so it coordinates you've got to keep in mind we're getting stimulus we're getting visual stimulus all the time and then we're figuring out how to navigate through that and we're getting that both from feeling so like when i'm working in my I have a fairly small kind of like gallery style kitchen and I have a really very tall, he's not, I don't know if so he's fat, but he's like, he's, he's just a very tall, big man. Um, and when I'm trying to navigate around him in our little galley kitchen, um, I'm using my periental look to know where he is and where I am and where I need to be and where he is and super complicated and doesn't always go well. I sometimes maybe get gripey. So that's a thing that happens. Um, the temporal lobe is going to be where 
um, we're going to have a visual center and we're also going to have um, a language center. So on the right side, that's where we're going. That's more of the visual center of the temporal lobes. So um, prosopagnosia, there's some of these nosias that I have a hard time saying but the ability to recognize a person's face. So there are people who have right side temporal lobe damage who may not be able to recognize the faces of people. They'll know it's a face, they know it's a person. They just don't necessarily know that it's the face of a person that they've ever met before. Um, and then if you have left side damage, um, these pictures below are actual pictures of people who had left side damage and they would see something and they can't uh, they can't put the right word with the right object right they might get you can understand how they got close but they're not actually it's called Wernicke's aphasia actually and it's where you can't attach the right um thing with the right object. So like these are actual pictures from people who had this particular kind of aphasia of somebody who would call a coconut, an acorn, a coconut. Um, our good friend uh, Dave Anders from On With Life tells a story about when he was helping somebody, there was somebody that they, they had been working with who had this partic particular kind of aphasia. And they were working on her being able to use language. And so one of the things that they were going to do is drive through the drive through of a Wendy's or a McDonald's or whatever and have her order her food. And she, this particular lady really liked Mountain Dew. So she got up to the little speaker box to order her food and she wanted to order a Mountain Dew. And instead of ordering a Mountain Dew, she ordered... Let me see if I can remember what it was. Nuclear, I think she called it nuclear margarita mix. Um, so you can see how, if you looked at Mountain Dew, how it could look maybe like nuclear mountain, uh, nuclear margarita mix. She was generally getting the idea. Um, you can, but you just don't know what that particular word means. Um, so I really, I think the reason why we get so obsessed with the, the language stuff is it's, it's important. Um, but also um, it shows how complicated language is. So I'm gonna spend a few minutes on that. There's a YouTube video that I'm gonna pull up here. This is a person who has Broca's aphasia. So this is a type of aphasia where you have effortful speech and it's, they understand the words, but they have trouble finding them. Diane, we cannot see or hear your video. You can't? Okay, hold on. All right, hold on. that better? Yes. Can't okay. hear though. I can't hear the sound. Nope. You can see the video, but not hear any of the sound. Oh, you can't hear it? Can't hear okay. it. Okay. I am so sorry. You can see the video, but you can't hear the sound. I'm not sure what to do about that. Okay, let me stop sharing again. Can you hear it now? Nope, okay.
All right. Sorry about that, gang. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. You can hear me? And can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. All right. It looks like that is not going to work, and that's too bad because that's a kind of cool video. Um, but basically, so I'm going to have to reenact that for you. Um, basically, broke as aphasia is when you can't find the word. So you know when you when you know what something is, but you can't find the word? I, everybody knows what that's like, right? I've got Heather, who I can see shaking her head. She's the only person I can see. <laughs> um, that's, if you think about that on a more global scale, that's what broke his page is. So the guy who I had talking, he, was, he, was, he talks in a very halted way because he's constantly like trying to find the words. And a lot of times, even people who you think have very fluid voices, fluid ways of speaking, and you may not think had broke his aphasia, they may have a little bit of extra trouble find, word finding, right? And there can be a temptation to try to like, you know what they want to say. And so you'll speak for them, right? Um, which really irritates many of them, right? Because they know what they want to say. They just need a minute to get it out, right? People with Broca's aphasia also can get very frustrated with themselves because they know what they want to say. They just can't say it. There's another form of aphasia called Wernicke's aphasia, um, which is when you use the wrong word. Um, and unfortunately you guys can't see the video, but this guy does a very good job of it, but they just keep that, but they're talking very fluidly, right? Like they're just, they're have, it sounds like you were just going to rate of speed and, and expression they're talking, but none words say that not Apple to it. They're just using all these like incoherent words. Sometimes you can kind of follow it, but they'll be using a lot of the wrong word and they don't know that they're using the wrong word. So what I always think of is I have two girls and they look kind of alike, but I don't think that that's necessarily the thing because my dad also called my brother and I by the wrong names. I will sometimes call one of my children by the wrong name, right? Particularly when they both lived in my house. And I'd be like, Claudia, blah, 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 when I meant Anna. And then she'd be like, Anna would be like, looking at me like, well, I don't know what you're saying because that's not who I am, right? But in my mind, I had said the right name, right? So people with Wernicke's aphasia tend to get more irritated at the other people. And if you've ever done this, if you've ever called somebody by the wrong, and you're like, you knew who I was talking to, I was looking at you. How could you not know that I was talking to you? Um, because you're irritated at them for not knowing that you met them when you were saying something completely different, right? Like, but when you have broker's aphasia, you you're trying to find the word, you can't find it. And that's, that's internally irritating. And when you're saying something and you feel like you're saying the right thing and you're not, and you think you are, then that becomes very much of a, that's your problem that you don't understand what I'm saying. It's not my problem that you don't understand what I'm saying. Cause I very clearly meant this. Um, so that's kind of how, that works as far as the language stuff is concerned. Um, occipital lobes uh, is in the back of the brain um, and it's primarily a visual center. Um, but if you look at this picture and you can see kind of the op optic chasm and all the ways that eyesight needs to go there's a lot of, the, I think the eyesight takes up like 70% of the brain, that process. There's a lot that can go on, can go wrong in that, um, in that section, right? Like, so a lot can go wrong. And these are some of the things that can go wrong. You can have partial blindness, which means that there's just a blank spot where you can't see anything. Um, there's a syndrome where you can only see a part of things. So you might be have a plate in front of you and you can only see the fork or you can only see the window on a house. Field cuts are super, that's a super thing that I see all the time um, is people that can, um, um, people just can't see a portion, a field of vision. So like they can't see the left or the right or the up or the down. Um, and double vision is something that we see all the time. 
And again, part of the reason why I want to go through all of these things on this first day together is that when we're thinking about really frustrated, really irritated people or people who are hyper, um, will get aggravated or they're what we call acting out and we think it's all frontal lobe damage, I also want to say if I saw double for any amount of time at all, I would be an aggravated person. It happened to me when I was trying to change contacts one time that I had double vision for a while. And um, it made me not a pleasant person to be around. It's hard to see double. So make sure that you know everything that's going on with a person before you just start to say it's just because of their frontal lobe damage and they don't have good control over their aggravation, right? There's all kinds of reasons to be aggravated, including we all know UTIs. So make sure that we're paying attention to all of that. Um, the cerebellum way back here in the very back is gonna control direction, rate of force, steadiness. If you do anything with your body, any kind of hand-eye coordination, um, all of that is handled in that portion of the brain. And then we get down to the mid parts of the brain, um, the parts of the brain stem. So the pons, I, we don't see a lot of people who have these particular problems because you can't breathe um, or have a heartbeat or do any of those things um, if you have midbrain problems. But I am going to go back to the cerebellum. Oh, let me see. Um, because if that's going to be a lot of uh, loss of control, inability to judge distance, um, but it's also going to cause like gait problems, speech problems, a lot of things like that. And then we've got that. Um, then the limbic system. The limbic system becomes really important um, with people with brain injury because this is your flight people tend to associate the limbic system just with flight, fight, or freeze, and it's actually much more complicated than that. Um, it has, it, it's the part of us that is the emotional memory. So when we think, especially like when we think of the amygdala, think about your spidey sense, that when you just feel in your bones that something is wrong. So if, and this is why if, if, this is out of kilter, or if we don't have enough cerebral cortex control or frontal lobe control, if we don't have anything checking the limbic system, then it kind of runs them up. So, um, and it associates, it's the part of us that helps us survive as a species. So because it's so connected to our short-term memory and how our short-term memory converts into long-term memory, it's the thing that tells us this is dangerous, you should run away, and you shouldn't spend a lot of time thinking about whether or not you should run away or hide or freeze or whatever, because what you mostly wanna do is get away from the big Tyrannosaurus Rex that is coming at you, right? Like this is the part of your brain that's gonna save you. Um, and you're going to get that spidey sense. Spidey sense goes wrong when, for instance, this is where, like, if, if you get bit by a dog as a little kid, you might develop a spidey sense fear of dogs when it's not all dogs that are going to bite you. Um, it is just the, you know, the, the dog that bit you. Um, so if you don't have that ability to have that corpus callosum or the frontal lobe kind of calm that amygdala down. So this is when that hand model comes in really handy. Like right now, like I've got this, like when I'm trying to explain to somebody what's happening to them when they're, um, when they're frightened, I'm like, here it is. Here's your amygdala. It's super out of control. Look at it being out of control. And then the way that we control it is to take that frontal lobe and loop it around and have it calm down that crazy amygdala, right? And right now, what we're trying to do is your job coach or your case manager or whatever is I'm trying to help you figure out how I'm trying to assist you, like give you the tools that you need. I'm trying to assist you in bringing down that frontal lobe and calming down that amygdala. 
And that's what we're trying to do. A lot of times when we're working with people who are kind of prone to being upset or having that sort of fight, flight, freeze go out of control. Um, most of every, most of our senses um, are relayed through the thalamus. So your touch, your eyesight, everything is going to come through the thalamus. This is where all of that sensory information comes in, right? So there you get sight, all of the stuff comes in and it wraps around the thalamus, comes into the thalamus. The thalamus decides, well, I need to alert the limbic system and we need to be able to react without really thinking. Or I'm going to send it to the frontal lobe and let the frontal lobe decide what we're going to do with all of this sensory information. The only thing that doesn't go through the south thalamus is smell, which is why smell is such a, like, a prominent, like when you, have, it, have you ever smelled something and you start, you, it brings back a childhood memory before you've even realized that you're thinking, like, does that happen to anybody? Um, I know for me, we had a lot of mint in our backyard when I was a little, little kid. And so if I walk past mint, I will have the sudden feeling of being like a five-year-old in my backyard. Um, and it's, it happens before I can even register that I'm smelling anything. And it's because smell has like a sort of direct route. Um, the hypothalamus, which is part of the limbic system, is going to maintain homeostasis, um, which is a lot of the reason why we'll think about like thyroid problems and things like that that throw off homeostasis is going to be related to a lot of the brain injury problems. And here we have the thalamus. Um, so this is more about like limbic system, rep rep reptilian brain. This picture right here is diffused tension imagery, um, which I'm going to just show you this picture. And we're just going to look at it together. And we're going to do what my daughter does when we, she wants me to look at our dog. And she's like, look at it, 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 look at it. Isn't it amazing? I love the this particular kind of imagery for the brain because this, all the different colors are showing the different directions that information or energy is moving through the brain. Like I know for a fact that blue is up down, right? So when I'm telling you that you've got all these different lobes and all these different lobes do all these different things, but that they all work together, look at it, look at it, look at it, look at it. Isn't it amazing? oh my gosh, how cool that we have this intergalactic highway in our brain that makes everything work. It is so cool. Occasionally something gets hurt. <laughs> and when it gets hurt, there you might have a backup, like either a traffic jam or actually like a bridge go out somewhere in this beautiful, beautiful thing that is our brain. And that's going to cause you to have to find a new way around this intergalactic highway to be able to help your clients. So when they start having a blockage right here, you're like, hey, but dude, we can walk around here. We can find these other, we can use, all, we're going to have somebody come in and talk about apps and all kinds of assistive technology that we can use. We can talk about, um, other um, mindfulness meditations and things like that that help us learn how to use our brains and how to calm our brains down. Um, what do we do? How do we deal with language when we're struggling? And we do that by figuring out how to work around this beautiful, oh my gosh, beautiful thing that is our brain. So the fortunate thing about brains is that we all have neuroplasticity. So you have neuroplasticity and you have neuroplasticity and you have neuroplasticity and your neuro and your person served has neuroplasticity. We used to think that only babies had the ability to build new connections in their brain. And that is just not true for any of us. And thank God, because I am way too old to, and I do not want to not be able to feel like I'm making new connections in my brain and making everything work better and finding new ways around things. And I can do that because I still have the ability to improve things in my brain.
And let's see, we've only got five minutes, so I'm not going to show this video, um, but it's a video of Ernest Hemingway talking. Um, Ernest Hemingway uh, had so many brain injuries. Um, the last one he had because he tried to bang his way out of a burning plane using his head. Um, and so when you get this slide set, please look at this video and watch the way that Ernest Hemingway talks um, and know that this guy was still writing and functioning and doing some stuff while he had oh my gosh, so many brain injuries. Um, and so I always like to think about this is now it's not, not time to think what you do not have, but think of what you can do and what there is. Um, always that is true of our folks with brain injury. Wanna, we want to know what they have, what, what fires them up, what makes them work. Um, and all that said, uh, TBI is a chronic and lifelong disease. Um, and we're here to be on that journey with those folks. So let's see. Um, I like this little visual, which is to say that um, you're here to walk along the journey with your person served and to find the pieces that they're struggling with. You're gonna help them find those pieces and help them make a new life. Um, again, a good friend of mine always says that we may not be able to give people back the life they had, but we can help them find something that's just as good if we can help them figure their way around that crazy intergalactic highway. It's a lot of me talking for a long time, and I'm hoping that somebody has a question somewhere in these last three minutes. Um, Diane, um, yeah. we've got some comments that uh, Tina shares. It's a, it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Cheyenne thought that your visual of the beautiful, beautiful brain was great, <laughs> that it is beautiful. Um, <laughs> Amy says, thanks. Um, Cheyenne loved this, said it was the best presentation. Um, I would just like to thank you so much for your time. I I did not ever get tired of listening to your explanations and I thought it was incredibly useful. Um, we will be recording this and sharing the link as well as the presentation materials with everyone who registered. Um, our next session is January 20th, 3.30 to 4.30. Or 12th, is it the 20th or the 30th? When is it? Is it 20th? 20th, okay. So, um, Please, please join us again, uh, and we will get that as soon as our recording is uploaded. We'll share the link for today's session as well as the presentation materials. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Diane, or this is Amy Dessenberg Wines. You're welcome to reach out to me as well. And I just want to thank Diane so much. Thank you, Diane. And one more thing, I did share, and it is on the uh, my email is out there. Send me your questions, send me your cases. Um, you know, I've spent a good bit of time talking, thinking about what we're going to talk about in the next three sessions, but I am not done. And if I know what it is that you want to know, I will definitely figure out how we can address those specific cases, situations, what's going on that would bring you here today. And let's make sure that we meet that need. All right. Perfect. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening.